Okay, so today I want to continue talking about the properties of holomorphic function connected to uh, the value of the integral of a holomorphic function over a curve, uh, closed curve in particular. So last time we have shown that for a holomorphic function, um, on a rectangle, the value of the integral over the contour is zero, right? This is good. This is the statement of Gursa theorem. Huh? <coughs> and we also uh, have considered ad other examples of, fun of uh, holomorphic functions for which this, this uh, similar property is valuable with a generic curve. Uh, generic means a bit more strange than a rectangle. Um, and we also showed that when the function is not holomorphic at one point, the example was, remember, this, which is a function with only one singularity in A. It's not defined, it's not defined, not even continuous in A, so it's not holomorphic, but elsewhere it is holomorphic. And we have calculated the integral of uh, gamma, the circle of radius r centered at a, right? r positive. And we obtain that this number is not zero. T zero to pi. So. <coughs> It's not always the case that the, the fun any complex valued function has integral equal to zero over a closed curve. On the other side, we have seen that if the complex valued function has a primitive, complex primitive, then this is true. Hmm? Good. Now, we'll investigate a little bit more what are the consequences of this is Gursa theorem, right? of this, and we'll then study a bit more in detail this case, right? So I will start from considering this possibility. Now assume that the function f is holomorphic in a disk. D, I sometimes use also B, okay, for the disk, because B is the um, the letter used for balls, okay? So the the ball in the plane is called disk, right? B, B being a ball centered at R at A and over radius R. Hmm? Now we can take given z and the disk, this is the open disk, right? Normally when I use this parenthesis, I mean open disk. So just a matter of notation. If I want to indicate the closed disk, I use either the overline, okay, which cannot be confused with the conjugate because it's a set, right? But in any case, when I want to consider also the the contour, the, uh, the boundary, then I use either this or in some books you can find here other parentheses, you know, like for the intervals and in, on the real. Okay. Um, I will often use also the terminology as follows. When I say domain, I will consider open and connected sets. Okay? So domain, D means an open and connected. So disk, the disk is somehow the prototype of any, of any uh, interesting domain. But in any case, when I say domain, I mean something more general, something which is, for instance, not a disk, but open and connected. Now, in a disk, I can start by considering something which we already done, okay? The function f of z being 
capital F. Huh? Yeah, we have the holomorphic function F being defined as follows. So take Z, and this will be the potential. But how? You can, this is the integral over sigma of F uh, C D C. C sigma being uh, this curve here, okay? Uh, polygonal path connecting connecting a the center to the to z with segments parallel to axis. This is um, imagine that this is right. So this function is defined, hmm? and of course, because of Gursa theorem, we also have the following. Right. We produce the same situation. So. I move this way, first horizontal and then vertical, and connect the point Z, A to the point Z, okay? So this is sigma for me. But, well, since I know that the integral of f of Z dz is zero, when here I have a rectangle, because of Gursa theorem, then I can also consider, equivalently, this path, with two segments parallel to the axis, but in the opposite, so in the opposite order. So first parallel, first vertical, and then horizontal. Now remember that this. Well, if you want, if z z is the integral of f of z dx plus i f of z dy, right? So when I take the derivative of f with respect to x, we have f of z. When I take the derivative of f with respect to y, I have i f of z, like it was in our in, in an, another previous argument used for for the definition of the of the potential, hmm? which means that the function f is in fact complex analytic or holomorphic, it satisfies Cauchy-Riemann equation. So th since it, this is well defined and f as a primitive, holomorphic, holomorphic primitive, then I can conclude that the integral over any closed curve gamma inside the disk is zero. Okay, I have a holomorphic primitive, and this is. And of course, this works fine also for another class of open sets, not only the disk, say, an L, if the contour is an ellipse, it works fine, because you can always put inside the rectangle and repeat. So we have a very general case, but not the most general case. Okay? However, if you consider just locally, and holomorphic function can be studied just locally, you can say that locally this property is valid. So the integral over a small closed curve around the definition, of, so in a neighborhood, in an open disk, okay, of a point, well, you can always say, well, the integral of a, a closed curve is zero for a holomorphic function. And as I already uh, recalled, uh, this is not true if the function is not holomorphic at one point. Correct? So, but let me show you that we can somehow um, extend also for the class of polymorphic function, 
in an open ball or in an open set without uh, holomorphicity defined all over, but in some with some singularities, finite singularities, and additional good geometric properties of these singularities, in order to have the same the same fact about the integrals. So you take F holomorphic. and a rectangle. So this is somehow uh, another general version of Gursa theorem, weakening a little bit the condition of regularity of functions. So in a rectangle R, and as I already said for the Gursa theorem, the statement of Gursa theorem, we are considering a function which is holomorphic in the neighborhood of the, of, the rectum, of the rectangle, then consider the integral over the contour of the boundary of the, of the rectangle. But <coughs> holomorphic this time is not in the entire rectangle, except for a finite number, say, C1, CK of points. Okay? So these points are called singularities. So they are not Okay, so what is important to to consider is find a number of singularities. Okay. And this is not enough because if we consider again the case of the function one over z minus a, this function is as a singular only at A, and we know that the integral of a, a, a rectangle over a curve huh, is not zero already. Hmm? But we assume that we have this good property, that the limit as z tends to each singularity of z minus xj f of z is zero. Okay, and this property is not satisfied by one over z, the function f of z one over z minus a. Correct. This has to be true for any singular. Then the integral of a the contour of the boundary of the rectangle of f of z, dz, is zero. Okay, as for the Gursa theorem, we'll use just geometric consideration. Remember that the proof is somehow not related to analysis, but just we, we divided the rectangle, subdivided into small rectangles, and then make consideration about the limit hmm, of this process. Good. So first of all, we can make a consideration just on one singularity, which is, of course, the interesting case, and then repeat the same argument for a finite number of singularities. And we also can assume that the singularity can be isolated, say, in a subdivision, I'm sorry, of this time, such a way that the singularity, say, say j, is inside a square. Instead of subdividing, as we did last time, the rectangle in four uh, rectangles similar to the previous one, we, we adopt this decomposition in such a way this, is, this singularity is the center of a square of radius say, L, of radius, of, uh, say, of side L, of course. Huh? This can be done. And as we observed last time, the fact that we are calculating the integral over the boundary of R is equivalent to considering the integral over the small sub-rectangles and sub-squares, whatever, here, right? Because the contribution you have 
on this side is what contributes to the integral of r. But what you have here, putting this orientation, is balanced by considering the contribution here. So each time you have opposites, OK? So at the end of the story, what is left is just the rectangle, sorry, the um, um, the integral over the square centered at Cj. If we show that this is 0, we are done. So if there is no extra contribution, when considering this special case, we, are, we reduce our consideration to the previous case, huh? which means without singularities. Now, let me just use the same notation I have here. OK, so the integral of the r OK, Q is the, the square, OK? This is Q, and this is R. What do we have? We have the assumption, the assumption that, well, uh, yes. The modulus of f, right, the modulus of f is more than epsilon, uh, I'm sorry, as I said, well, this is, right? Uh, no, sorry. <laughs> now we have this, right? Limit as z tends to cj, fz times z minus cj is right. So right, this is zero. I have this, or modulus of f of z is more or equal to epsilon. Okay. <coughs> On the other hand side, <coughs> remember that we are in a square Q. This is Cj. And any point z we are considering for the integral is on one of the sides, right? So that the distance between z and cj is at least l over 2, l being the length of the sine. Correct? Listen. I see it this way, right? So any other segment connecting the center of the uh, is longer than L, L over 2. All right? Now, <clears throat> the integral over R of Fz dz, as I said, as a modulus, which is the integral, as a modulus of this. And this is smaller or equal to the integral of modulus of f of z dz. Remember, this was one of the inequalities we proved last time, and we used several times. But now, f of z.
from here has a module which is smaller or equal of epsilon over the distance of z minus cj, right? In other words, putting together our inequalities, we have the integral over r of f of z dz is smaller or equal to the integral of the q of the modulus of f of z dz. And this is smaller or equal to epsilon, remember the integral over dq, z minus cj dz. But remember that z minus cj is greater or equal to L over 2. So at 1 over modulus of z minus cj is smaller or equal to 2 over L. So again, I put this integral over dr, uh, dq, sorry, epsilon <coughs> 2 over L dz. Correct? So this is a constant number, which does not depend on z. You can take it out from the integral. And, well, what is left is the sum of the sides, of the length of the sides of the, the, the square, q. But the square q has, of course, uh, uh, its it side is l, so it's 4l, right? So this is. 4L times 2 epsilon over L, which cancels out and gives you 8 epsilon, so it is smaller than epsilon prime, so it is infinitesimal. And this concludes the proof, because you can repeat the same argument by considering squares surrounding the finite singularities we are considering. Okay. Good. And with this in mind, we can also say the following. Well, start from a function f, holomorphic, and d, the disk. But <coughs> I omit, as for the rectangle, a finite number of points where the function is not holomorphic anymore. Right? Call it d prime. So it's punctured disk. Well, <coughs> the situation is like this. A, and then I have some points. where the holomorphicity fails to be satisfied. So it's not. However, I can. So let me show it this way. Like in the previous case, I can always restrict my consideration to subsquares. Assume that this is the case, right? And I have a singularity here somewhere. Well, I can take this with a square and then define the function this way. I single out a singularity and, and surround it with a square, and then I repeat my consideration statement for starting from A from here, right? Because the contribution of the square is nothing for the, for the integral, of course. And I can define, starting from here, well, a function which is a potential again. So what I'm saying is that with the argument we used before, even if the function has some singularity, but find the singularities, together with the previous lemma I, I showed you geometrically, then we can extend the same result. So if you want the integral over, uh, over a, a closed curve, which does not pass along the singularity, it guarantees that this, uh, on, over this path, closed path, 
the integral of a holomorphic function is zero. And this is very important because from this we can have finally the Cauchy representation formula. But on the other side, we have, since we are missing to put in, in the class of function we can consider from now on the function which gave us interesting, an interesting counterexample to the general case, we want to investigate it a bit more in detail. <coughs> Namely, I have this seven, seven. <coughs> Take a closed path, closed curve, gamma, and take again the function z minus a time over 1 over z minus a, right? And assume that the closed car curve <coughs> is such that gamma of t is not a for any t. Okay? Gamma is defined in c. Now this function is, as I said, holomorphic and the complex plane, but not in A. So in the complex plane, in the punctured complex plane. Hmm? And assume that this closed curve we are considering is not passing through the point A. Uh, some irregularity, well, gamma is piecewise differentiable. It's a complex valued function with real variable. We assume that at least almost everywhere there is the, the tangent vector. Correct? Now I want to show you that, well, this number here, integral over gamma, 1 over z minus a, dz is a multiple of 2 pi i, right? In fact, in the example we considered as a closed curve, the circle centered at A of radius R, which of course is not passing through A because R is positive, right? Remember? It is a, a, a differentiable piece, well, it's a differentiable curve, and the result of this integral was 2 pi i. It was done by hands, huh? Okay. I will use this notation here. So I have. 7, 8. So gamma, assume that gamma is defined in I. I is the interval minus, well, alpha, beta, and to C. Okay, use alpha and beta because I don't want to use A and B. A is uh, already used for the, for the singularity. <laughs> and I define H of T to be the function integral from A to T of well, precisely this. I have to write it explicitly, but it means we are considering the integral over gamma of the function 1 over z minus a up to the time t. Correct? And I write it in, in, uh, by, substitution, by substitution and put s here and t is here. Correct? Good. Now, I can also, <coughs> well, where gamma is continuous, well, and gamma prime, say, is continuous, we can also say that h prime of t is gamma prime of t over gamma of t minus a. This is a fundamental theorem of calculus. This in a, in a real variable. Hmm? 
And then I define another function, g of t is e minus h of t times gamma t minus a. Okay? If you want, this is as gamma t minus a over e h of t. t varies in between alpha and beta. Okay. What is the derivative of g with respect to t? Well, we use standard rules. Huh? We have, if you want, e minus h of t times minus h prime of t. It is the derivative of this times gamma t minus a. So Leibniz rule applies. Plus e minus h of t times gamma prime of t. Right? All right. So <coughs> remember that, okay, I said, oh, I write it down again. So this is minus e minus h of t, h prime of t, gamma t minus a plus uh, e minus h of t, gamma prime of t, right? And remember that h prime of t it is gamma prime of t over gamma of t minus a. So when I substitute, and when, it is, when I'm allowed to do this, okay, so I substitute h prime of t here, I cancel this and this, and what I have is this is what? Zero for any t. So g is constant. And in particular, g of alpha, remember g of alpha was defined by using the function e minus a. Huh? But this is zero because the integral between alpha and alpha. So this is one. And so we have this. Right? You see this? Okay. Thus, from the fact that g of t is e minus h of t times gamma t minus a, I conclude this, right? When I put as t alpha, and remember that h of t was defined in this way, the integral from alpha to t of gamma prime s over gamma s minus a ds. So the integral is clearly zero when you take as t alpha. All right, so we can also say the following. Now, g of t is constant. Okay, g of t is gamma alpha minus a for any t. That's what we have discovered after considering the derivative of g and proving that the derivative is zero. But e minus h of t times gamma t minus a, which is g of t, is in fact gamma alpha minus a. So that I can also say that gamma t 
minus a over gamma alpha minus a is, and this is, this number here is different from zero, right? Because we are assuming that the curve stays away from a for any t. Gamma t is not zero. It's not a, sorry. So gamma alpha minus a is different from zero. And this is, from this quality, you see I put here this over this is, is over this, right? Is 1 over e minus alpha t, h of t, sorry, right? Is it correct? Yes. And this is e h of t. But remember that, the, the, is it correct? <coughs> Remember that the, the curve was closed, was assumed to be closed, so gamma of alpha is gamma of beta. In other words, gamma of beta minus A over gamma of alpha minus A is 1. Right? This is the left-hand side when I substitute t with beta. So on the right-hand side, I have that this is E H beta. Then I, remember, I have to remember that the H of beta was the integral from alpha to beta of gamma prime S, of, which is precisely this from the definition of the integral over a closed path. So what I have here is that this integral provides a number whose exponential is a complex number, huh? whose exponential is equal to 1. And we already noticed that the exponential of 0 is 1, but the the exponential is periodic period 2 pi. So this number here has to be a multiple of 2 pi i. And that's what, hence we conclude that the integral of gamma is 2k pi i, k and z. Which is very important. So we associate to a point and a curve an integer. Okay, let me just and this integer has a name. Definition the index of point with respect to the closed curve gamma is defined in the following way. In short, n gamma a, okay, so it depends on gamma, it depends on, is just the integral of a gamma or 1 over z minus a, is z. This number is also, well, it is called index of the point a, and it's also known as winning number. Ah, uh, sorry, sure. Definitely, this is not an integer. <laughs> Thank you. 1 over 2 pi i, of course, the integral, right. So, thank you. So, the integer we are, uh, we are dealing with is the integer which represents the, the yeah, the, the, the times of, of uh, the times of, um, of, the number of times, sorry, the number of times you are multiplying 2 pi i, okay? 
in the calculation of this integral. And this represents, if you think of the function 1 over z, uh, obviously the number of times the curves wins around the point A. In the case of 1 over z is the point 0, because you have the logarithm to be considered as primitive, okay, if you want. Now, good properties, and then come back to Cauchy integral formula. Good properties of this winding number or index properties. Well, one is obvious. Consider the integral over the curves with the reverse orientation. That is to say, consider this. As we know, this number is obtained from a calculation of an integral. And when we reverse the parameterization of the curve gamma, we obtain the opposite of the integral. So, <coughs> This is elementary property. Now, this is property number one, say. Property number two, assume that gamma, this is A, okay? And the curve gamma consider as Uh, no, letter, change letter, say put Z naught, okay? Z naught as a center, sorry. Take the disk centered as Z naught of radius R. Assume that gamma is contained in D, like here. Of course, I'm, I use some abuse of notation, which is very common in any textbook. So when I say gamma, I mean sometimes the function, sometimes the set of values. Well, in this case, I mean, well, if you want to be very precise, gamma of i, right? So the set of values, okay, the subset of c, which represent the values for gamma, the function gamma. In any case, I think that it is quite normal to, to interchange a role, so the function and of the curve, okay, as a set. Anyway, anyway. Uh, Assume that A is outside of this disk. This A is not containing D. What can I say about the index of N gamma A? Zero. Is zero, correct. Well, the answer is quite simple, if you think a little bit. Well, A outside of the disk means that the singularity is not considered where we are restricting our function. 1 over z minus A is no singularity. So it is holomorphic in the disk. It is holomorphic. So the integral of a closed curve is 0. Period. Okay? So the next property is probably the one which guarantees that this definition is important. So, n, ga n gamma a is constant on each uh, path connected components of c minus gamma. Right? And n, n gamma a is zero in the unbounded path connected compound. 
components how is c minus gamma well i omit to cons to say that of course gamma is to be a curve so nothing pathological like uh, you know piano curve or something like this Some, somehow i'm assuming that the curve is at least a jordan curve okay or well at least <laughs> no it can it can it can it can be a bit worse but it cannot uh, say fill an entire region of the plane so right so it is the image uh, somehow of a regular function of the interval and the values at the end are the same so it can uh, intersect itself several times but uh, it cannot be too pathological so there is an unbounded path kinetic components and what i want to prove you is that well this index is the same for any point in the same path connected component. All right? Now, let us consider no, I'm sorry, two points, A and B. And the same path connected component so that we can join the one to the other, okay, with a, the with a path. So <coughs> in particular, we can join like this, okay, with polygonal path. And we restrict our case, we prove the invariance of the index for a B joined by a segment, correct? So then we can repeat for on, for on each segment of the polygonal curve. Now, what I'm, well, a segment, of course, which does not intersect Gamma, yeah. so it's clear. Well, in the in the in the same path connected region of the complement of gamma, so it cannot intersect. Right? So we can join two points with a curve, with a path, which is not intersecting gamma in general. And in particular, we are sticking our consideration to uh, to a just to a segment, and then we prove it that from this. You can you can conclude the same for a polygonal path and that's it. Okay, now I take z minus a over z minus b. Well, this is a and this is b and this is the segment and if z is not here, the segment call it, uh, we call it t, right? If z is not in t, this number here is not a real number. It's not multiple. Hmm? It's not only a real number, but it cannot be a non-negative real number. So that, what do we have? We have that when z is not on the interval connecting t and a, it, it connecting a and b, sorry, we can consider the principal branch of the complex logarithm of this. You see? Well, this is A, this is B, this is Z here. This is Z minus A, right? This is Z minus B. It's not a real number. It's not proportional to one as a vector, hmm? unless z is here, or here, or here, so on the line connecting a and b. Okay, so this number is not so, not even zero, huh? but also negative, and so the log 
of z minus a over z minus b is well defined. What I mean by well defined? There is no ambiguity for the choice of the arg of z minus a over z minus b, right? Because this number, this ratio here, is not surpassing the uh, negative real axis. So it is, if you want, the image of this function here is contained in C with a slit from 0 to minus infinity. So the logarithm is well defined. There is no problem of making a tour around the 0, right? OK. Now, remember that we want to prove that the integral of, so the index, the integral over gamma, over, yes, over gamma is the same as the integral with respect to b. Huh? Now, this is the integral over gamma, 1 over z minus a, dz, from the definition. And this is the integral. This has to be proven, right? Yes. What we want. Huh? Uh, on the right hand side, we have this. On the other hand, we have also considered this function here. Sorry. This is well defined and holomorphic. when we stay away from the segment connecting A and B. Now, it is holomorphic in its derivative is 1 over z minus A minus 1 over z minus B. Right? Are you with me? OK, so we have all, all the ingredients to conclude. Because on the right hand side, we have just the difference of the integrand we are considering here. On the left hand side, we have, when taking the integral, the derivative, sorry, the integral over a function which has a complex analytic, also a holomorphic primitive. The primitive is written here. So the integral over gamma of the function log of z minus a, z minus b dz is clearly 0 because we have a, a, a holomorphic potential of this function. Hmm? It's analytic. Hmm? On the other hand, this is the integral over gamma, y over z minus a minus integral over gamma, 1 over z minus b. And of course, I forgot to put 1 over 2 pi i in front, but we want to prove just that they are the same. And this is 0, so this is proven. Now, <clears throat> just to conclude, if a is in the unbounded uh, path connected component, of the complement of gamma. It means that, well, we can take A as any point very far from gamma. So that gamma can be surrounded by a disk where the function we are considering 1 over z minus A is, in fact, holomorphic. Because <coughs> the, um, the index is, this is invariant for, from, for points which are in the same path kinetic components. So I can take A to be very far, say take A prime very far from, from, from gamma. Take the integral of gamma, this is zero, right?
because of the previous considerations. So with all these new properties and information together, let me point out that we have all the details for the important tool of Cauchy integral representation formula. Now consider function f holomorphic and d, d the disks. And consider capital F of z to be f of z minus f of a over z minus a. F is holomorphic in the disk, but not in A. So if you want, we are in the situation where we have a function holomorphic with one singularity. But luckily enough, the limit as z tends to A of f of z times z minus A is the limit as z tends to A of f of z minus f of a, which is zero, because f is in fact continuous in a. f is holomorphic and then continuous in a. Not capital F, the other one, <laughs> the starting one, okay? So in other words, we have the hypothesis to apply the version of the, the, the theorem we, we uh, have, the good star weakened version, right? So the integral of a gamma of f of z, capital F of z, the z is zero. Gamma closed curve, which, sorry, which doesn't pass through A. Hmm? Um, well, you can also rewrite this as the integral of a gamma of fz minus fa, z minus a, dz, right? And then we apply the additive property of the integral. Remember that the integral over a curve, over a segment before and over a curve, was obtained by repeating the consideration of integral of real integrals the real imaginary part of the function. So all additive properties, the linearity was, were satisfied. And then I have here, sorry, minus f of a, z minus a over dz. So since this is zero, Zero is the integral of a gamma f z, z minus a dz minus integral of f a, z minus a dz, which was in fact the integral of gamma of capital F of z dz, okay? But f of a is a constant with respect to z, so that I can also write that f of a times integral of 1 over z minus a over gamma and dz is the integral gamma f of z, z minus a, dz. And this is exactly what we have called n gamma a times 2 pi i. Right? So that f of a is 1 over 2 pi i, uh, yes, and gamma a and this is a Cauchy integral formula. 
Well, this is one version of the Cauchy integral formula, which applies, of course, for the case of the punctured disk, because in this specific case, we have the weakened version of Broussard theorem. It applies also for more generic uh, subsets, take, for instance, the ellipse or something else. But with the tools we have, we cannot, as I said, we cannot give the very general statement. Hmm? So, in fact, I will not give it in. Well, I just give it. I will not prove it, all right, if you don't mind. In any case, this is the local version. Say, you have a disk, and this is enough. Huh? In particular, this formula becomes also very in, in, <coughs> interesting when we consider, as a gamma, the circle and the circle which just surrounds the points A once and with the um, positive orientation because this number becomes 1. So the con in some sense, this gives you an integral mean value property for holomorphic functions. So the value at the center of the disk, the value of the center for holomorphic function is obtained as a, an average, an integral average, the function with this weight z minus a, the denominator, along the circle. And 1 over 2 pi i, again, is a weight. Hmm? So if you want, if you know the value of a holomorphic function in a circle, then you can obtain a value in the center. So one, huh? And then Do we have any an analog property in the real case? I have one, but uh, I don't know the, the reverse. It means in English. I have one, but I don't know the Do you, do you have one example? Is it general property like this? The opposite. What do you mean? In French. In uh, French. No. My F, F, uh, X. If, if we, we need the minus. The okay. In the real case, you have to restrict to, to, to the values on the ending points, right? <laughs> if you have information on the ending points of the integral, well, you cannot reconstruct the function inside. Here it is the way. And well, this is a, a peculiar property. In fact, from this, we'll, from this property, we obtain one fact which is not true in the real case. That is to say that any holomorphic function, so any, any function which satisfies this, huh? so cauchy riemann equations or complex derivation and what, and what we have proved to be equivalent is enough to show that the function is, in fact, complex analytic. All right? So we have several examples of functions which have derivative, real derivation, valid, but not, they are not real analytic. Hmm? which, by the way, guarantees that the function is C infinity. So I don't think that any C1 function is also C2, Cn in the real case. Actually, it's not. Hmm? So this is another, another word. And this mostly depends on this property. But as I said, well, it is important to mention the general proposition, which is the following. The following. Number... 17. So I have to recall you what we mean by two homotopic curves. Do you know this? Do you, or have you already seen the definition of homotopy, the notion of homotopy in topology and algebraic topology? Okay, I will recall it to you. So take two curves, gamma gamma prime, K, 
curves with same end points. So in the plane, this is gamma and this is gamma prime. Right? This is the graph associated to gamma and gamma prime. Is that two? Okay. Now we make some. Com okay. We, of course, assume that the functions are continuous, and we carry scale the the interval or definition of the two functions such a way that just for the sake of simplicity that the interval is zero one. Okay. So the gamma zero is the starting point, and this is. If you want to avoid some ambiguity, put gamma 1, OK, instead of gamma prime, because prime means derivative. OK, you're all correct. Gamma 1, two curves. Sorry. Gamma 1 and gamma. Pardon me? I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, sure. The ending point is gamma 1. So that the function gamma and gamma 1 are defining the standard interval 0, 1 into C. And well, in general, to, into a topological space, OK, with some problems. So in, in this case, we are considering curves in the plane, in the complex plane. And the function H, which turns out to be continuous function from I times I, into the same uh, plane in this case, but topological space in general, is said to be an homotopy. This is continuous such that. So imagine this to be the same parameter for the function and the other a deformation of parameters. So imagine that this is a family of function which continuously deform the first curve into the other. This is the sense of homotopy. So such that ht of 0 is gamma t for any t. ht of 1 is gamma 1 of t for any t in E. All right. And what we are also requiring is that when s is not 0 or 1, is in between. Okay, so when it is, in fact, another curve, h0 of s is h1 of s is e Sorry, h, sorry. h0 of s is gamma 0, which is also gamma 1 of 0. So the same starting point for all the curves in this family of the formation of curves and the same ending point. If this is the case, we say the two functions are homotopic. And we also indicate this by considering this relation, which is, by the way, uh, an equivalence relation. Mm -hmm. You can prove that any curve is, in fact, homotopic to itself, that if gamma is homotopic to gamma 1, gamma 1 is homotopic to gamma to gamma, and so on, OK? And the, the, the transitive properties is also valid. So in particular, we can also consider the case, well, this is the generic case. Well, not generic, because here it's just C. But well, you can consider topological space. And this provides you information, OK? So that you can deform curves. But in particular, we are interested in closed curves, which are also called, in algebraic topology, loops. So two loops are equivalent if there is an homotopy function with the same properties, but as I was writing here, in fact, thinking 
about the loops and not think about the general case. Well, the starting point and the end, ending point is the same. Now, the problem in algebra topology is to, well, to problem. The, the inter interesting tool uh, connected to homotopy is the fact that you can use algebraic properties associated to the class of loops to define to, to make a topological comparison of sets. For just to give you an example, it's quite obvious that if you consider the set, this set here, well, and you consider a loop, any loop inside this set here, you have the freedom of deforming it to the point here. Whatever loop you consider, even very complicated, you can deform it. But assume that you are taking a domain like this, so with a hole in the middle. It's not true that starting from any loop, you can deform. Remember that, well, <coughs> I didn't point out here. But, well, the homotopy has to be a function which is continuous in the square i times i, but its values has to be contained in the set we are dealing with so that the deformation is allowed only inside here, okay, in this analogous, essentially. Yeah? It's like an analogous. From the topology point of view, it's like an analogous. Mm -hmm. So that, for instance, this loop can be evidently shrink into a point, but this cannot remaining in the domain. So there is an obstruction, hmm? topological obstruction. All right. Well, this will be probably shown in the course of topology, of algebraic topology, I don't know. And it's, well, related to the fundamental group, to homology, and so on, which is another topic. But for the case we're interested in, it suffices to know that the index is, uh, the index as we define, is homotopic invariant. Okay, and that's that's a result which I don't want to prove you. <laughs> so, uh, fact. Assume that gamma and gamma one are two closed <coughs> curves, which are homotopic, then the integral of a gamma of f of z dz is the integral of a gamma 1 of f of z dz okay, in domain d. And f holomorphic in d. And well, <coughs> turns out that actually, if these are closed curves, this number is here, it's zero. So any other deformation gives you something which does not provide any special contribution for the integral. In particular, as we know, then consider a simply connected domain. which is a domain with the proper, you know what I mean, what we mean when I say, when we say simply connected. What do we mean? So any loop is in fact homotopically equivalent to a constant. So in the previous sketchy examples, I gave you, well, a domain in which this property apparently works fine, and another one, the, 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 the domain homeomorphic to the analogs, well, it doesn't apply. Hmm? Good. So, but uh, luckily enough, 
In the case of plane domains, this uh, property can be simply characterized. Hmm? And it be characterized in, in the following way. Well, uh, since simply domain D in C, this is equivalent to say that C minus D is connected. Luckily enough, so that on which any closed curve is homotopic to a constant. Well, this is just in C. This characterization is true, not in, uh, uh, for instance, in an R3, remove a one point to sphere. Well, this is simply connected with this. To, okay, take a sphere minus of one point. The complement is, of course, not connected, but the, the sphere minus one point in R3 is, in fact, simply connected. Right? Okay. So the last thing I wanted to show you today, since time is running, right, is the following. Okay. Uh, as a consequence of this, Consequences So if F is holomorphic in a simply connected domain, then As I said, this is zero, or there exists a holomorphic function capital F such that F prime of Z is F of Z, potential primitive. This is because whenever I have this property for closed curve, gamma closed curve, curve in D, I can define the potential of primitive, which turns out to be analytic. As an example of application, let me consider this one. I have no. <coughs> which is the following. F holomorphic and such that F of Z is different from zero for any Z. So F holomorphic is say in D. I'm not assuming that D is simply connected. But I'm assuming that the function f is uh, well, I'm not I'm assuming actually that D is simply connected, but also I'm assuming that f of z is different from that. What I'm not assuming is that f of d is simply connected. Okay. All right. So since f is not zero for any z in d, I can consider the function g of z to be uh, f prime of z over f of z. And g is well-defined and holomorphic
in D. Remember that f holomorphic guarantees that this function is defined and turns out to be holomorphic. Uh, the f of z is also different from zero, so I can consider the ratio of two holomorphic functions, and they are, this ratio is still holomorphic. I can consider the derivative, and the derivative is well defined for any z in D. Now, since D is simply connected, then this implies that there exists a holomorphic function G such that G prime of Z is equal to G of Z. So there exists a holomorphic primitive. And I define h of z to be the exponential of g of z. This is also well defined and holomorphic. Now, I consider, finally, the ratio f of z over h of z. Now, remember, g of z is whatever you want. Hmm? It can be also 0, but x of g of z is not 0 again. So that this ratio here is holomorphic. And d. Let us calculate the derivative. Okay, h of z. Oh, sorry. Uh, this function, call it p of z, okay? Has a derivative the derivative of f times h minus h prime z f of z over h of z square. Now, h of z is x of g of z and g prime of z is g of z, which is, remember, f prime of z over f of z. Right? When I substitute here, <coughs> so h prime of z is in fact x of g of z times g prime of z, so it is h of z, right, times g prime of z, this. Correct? So P prime of Z is F prime of Z over H of Z because I cancel one H, okay, from this summoned here, minus, and H prime is H F prime over F times F, so F prime H, H cancel H, so it is F prime of Z or h of z, which is 0. And this is true for any z. In other words, the function p of z is constant because we have already shown that the holomorphic function whose derivative is constantly 0 on an open. Well, I didn't say this, but when, I'm, when we are talking about simply connectedness, we are talking about 
connected open sets with this property because otherwise we have to talk about each component, each connected component to be simply connected, right? Um, so that, let me conclude. So P of Z as constant, in other words, H of Z is time of C is F of Z. And this is C times X of G of Z. Since C is a, con a constant from the properties of the exponential, this can be also written as X of G of Z plus C prime. Okay, call this function M of Z, which depends on C prime. So you have freedom of choice, C prime. But then what you have here is that M of Z is the logarithm of F. And if you want, uh, assume that f of z naught, which is different from zero, can be written as x of w naught. Okay. So that we can take c prime in such a way that well, well there are severals, but when you fix the value to one point, so if you if you fix that at, at for z equal to z naught m of z is w naught, then there is only one logarithm. So you have the choice, you have the opportunity to choose whatever you want c, here, c, one, c prime here, but when you fix the value of the function, then the function is also. In this sense, it means that whenever you have a function, holomorphic, and not zero, you can always define its logarithm in a simply connected domain. Which explains why we have some, we are in troubles in the play. Because as I said, well, the exponential, complex or real exponential is never zero. So we have to remove zero from the plane. Okay? On the other hand, when I remove zero, the complement is not simply connected in the extended, in the extended Riemann sphere. There are two points. Huh? The, com sorry, so the complement is not connected. Sorry, the complement is not connected. So this set, in fact, is not simply connected. So. If we restrict and we want to make it simply connected, we restrict, well, we have to take a slit, so an half line, connected zero to infinity, or another curve, and then we are done. So there is no way to define a logarithm. The function f of z to be considered in this case is simply this, which is not zero only for z different from zero, right? But when you remove zero, and then from topological properties of the set, you have also to remove an up line starting from zero and going to infinity. Okay? That's why in any so also from from topology there are some obstruction to extending the complex logarithm to the entire infinite annulus. Uh, or if you want to the puncture plane, all right? Uh, this property will be used several times. So remember that, please, simply connectedness, if you don't know anything about homotopy, well, it's nothing very difficult in a plane because you simply consider the complement of the set and prove it to be or not connected. Unfortunately, simply connected, simply connected can be also meant as simply 
pause connected, but it's not a domain which is connected and nothing else. So simply means simply connected. So it's a unique, unique uh, definition, which is a bad translation, bad calc from, from the French, because this was invented by Poincaré. Okay. Uh, all right. So in case you are interested in homotopy and that stuff, please study it, and which is an interesting, an interest, which is an interesting subject, which interplays topology and algebra. But this will not be the main. The main. Uh, so we will not use very much of uh, homotopy except for this definition, all right? Which in particular for the plane case is somehow trivial because, well, you have this very simple characterization of all simply connected domains. However, simply connected domains turn out to be in complex analysis very important. And as we'll see at the end of the course, or maybe just mention if we change our, there are uh, uh, essentially three fundamental uh, simply connected domains which are studied more and which represent, uh, which give you all the Interesting, interesting example, since any simply connected domain can be put in, uh, in relation with these three models, which are the disk, unit disk, the plane, and the Riemann sphere. They are all simply connected. They are not equivalent in the sense of holomorphic functions, but they represent the unique examples, interesting examples, which you can deal with for the very generic study of uh, all the domains in the plane. Okay, thank you. I stop here. <laughs>